Trashomaniacs. Gearheads. It's time again for another installment of the Geo Gearheads. I'm Daryl W. Ford with the Bad Cop, back for episode 98, Caching Space number one. We're talking about geocaches and space. Not proximity this time, but maybe it's a good feature for another show. But this time we'll be talking about uh, space events, the ISS cache, travelers, and things like low Earth orbit caches. Yeah, I guess we uh, gave into the hype a little bit, but uh, we're geeks, and you know we can't avoid the shiny object that is space exploration. Oh, so true, and we're really excited to get into that. This is one of the shows, Daryl. There's a few topics that I get really excited about, and this is one of them. Awesome. Now, e- other things that I get really excited about and start talking before I realize I've used the wrong word. We did that last week. We said cash berry rather than cash sense on last week's show. That was the original name when the software was released on the BlackBerry, and it was renamed how many years ago? A long time ago. Yeah, I can't remember. And uh, that's a hazard, I guess, to following this stuff for so long. And my apologies for that reference, because that was in the show notes, which I put together uh, for that uh, whole section. And hopefully anyone who uh, went looking for it didn't have any problems finding it. It was right in the show notes, so uh, if you went over there, you know, that's another good reason to uh, hit our show notes rather than trying to copy stuff down, like uh, Scrapcat had mentioned, uh, while you're driving especially. Uh, so, you know, if you could do that, uh, you know, hit, hit the show notes, you can get a lot of stuff corrected that we might have uh, bumbled a little bit during the show. Now, next week, we're going to be recording two shows back-to-back. The first is on 3D printing. The second is uh, our next randomized show. And that's uh, where we're going to share some of the gifts with those who have uh, shared GeoGearheads with others, like uh, this guy did. Hi, this is Giz from New Hampshire. And uh, I'm leaving a message about the GeoGearhead podcast, the one specifically that dealt with getting accurate coordinates and marking waypoints. I thought that was very good. Uh, I learned a lot. As for me, how I'm spreading the word about your podcast, uh, I accessed your page on Facebook and and shared it with all my friends, uh, including muggles as well, and uh, certainly got a lot of strange comments from people, the the muggle audience, about what I was talking about, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I, I sure do enjoy your show. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, is Strange Reaction for Muggles what it's all about? You know, that's what I shoot for, but that's just me. Yeah, th- yeah thanks so much, uh, Giz. Uh, your name has been dropped in that hat, and next week you're likely to be uh, drawn as uh, uh, one of those people to receive those eight gifts. If you're spreading the word too, call us at 206-350-3647, and like Giz did, drop us a uh, voicemail. Or you can also email us at geogearheads at cashmaniacs.com before November 21st so we can get those in on that next show. And you might have the opportunity for one of those gifts. Now, if you want to watch these upcoming shows live, you can do that either through the Googles or through the YouTubes. That's through Google Plus Hangout on Air or through the YouTube live streaming on the 21st. The first show starts at 6.10 p.m. Pacific, 9.10 p.m. Eastern. And then the second one will start just about an hour later. Then in December, we return with show 101 on the 5th. That's another road caching edition with a couple, of, a couple who caches separately on business. Then we're talking on the 12th with the host of another popular Disney podcast about the location-inspired games in the Disney parks. Drop us any questions, feedbacks, tips, tricks, or whatever. Uh, and you can use the same phone number and email address for that. That's geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or 206-350-3647. Yeah, by all means, let us know uh, which shows you've enjoyed and what you'd like to hear more about. We're getting feedback uh, more as we've been approaching the end of the year, and that's helping to shape the future shows, even changing some of our plans. 
So keep that coming, and ideas for uh, shows or topics in the randomized shows are uh, beautiful. We love getting those. Now, tonight's show is really inspired by the hype from Groundspeak on their geocaching in space events. Uh, before they launched, uh, uh, they actually boasted more than 1,150 geocaching uh, in space events around the world on uh, November 6th and 7th. Uh, and then um, I'm probably going to actually butcher this name, but uh, astronaut Rick Mastraccio. Is that actually how it's uh, pronounced? That's how I've heard it pronounced several times now, so go with Mastraccio. Okay, so close enough. Uh, it was aboard that uh, ship destined for the uh, International Space Station, uh, the cache house there, and he carried the traveler uh, TB5JJN1. And remember, that's going to be in the show notes, so don't have to go look that up. <laughs> that uh, travel bug will be used as a, a teaching tool for uh, geography and science. Now, those events were to mark the return of geocaching to space, but most of them uh, ended up simply being like meet and greets. I hit a couple of those events myself, but uh, Bad Cap, you hit like the event. Well, I was lucky enough to attend an event hosted by the Groundspeak Lackeys at the Pacific Science Center. The event was held at the gift shop in the Laser Dome. So what could be better than lackeys, lasers, and launches? Yeah, I was going to say, you got to get the uh, space in there to really make that work. You know, maybe a whole bunch of virtual caches would have been nice, too. Yeah, well, there were some uh, virtual munsies, but we don't mention that when there are lackeys about. No, no, I, th I think that might be uh, grounds for uh, having your account locked over there, actually. You know, at the... Uh... Totally changing subjects here. At the block party, I got all the virtual munsies around headquarters. I just looked the other day, and there's a whole nother crop. I can't keep up with this. <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, let's get back on the uh, uh, event, because that was really cool, and I only caught a little itty-bitty piece of it, so why don't you give everyone an idea of what went on at that uh, uh, grandmother mm -hmm. of all events. <laughs> Certainly. Now... Everybody, once everybody was into the laser dome, Eric Shadisky, the public relations and special media manager for Groundspeak, introduced a real rocket scientist who would help us understand the tech talk from launch control. Because sometimes they go through stuff that you go, what does that mean? What are those acronyms mean? So she helped us through all this. Uh, Eric started it, or said that all this started when Groundspeak received an email asking how much a travel bug weighed. And that started a dialogue between Groundspeak and the astronaut. Uh, when we watched, uh, then we watched about an hour-long space-themed laser show, including scenes from Top Gun and several of the Star Wars movies. I mean, it was incredible to see those up on the uh, on the ceiling of the laser dome. We took a break and came back to watch the launch of TMA 11M. It's a Soyuz craft. It had three astronauts on board from three different countries and one little travel bug. The launch went off without a hitch, and uh, geocaching hit new heights. You see what I did there? Yeah, unfortunately yeah. I did. Yeah. <laughs> so so what does the TMA stand for? Too many acronyms? Too many acronyms is what I got. Okay, cool. So, yeah, that's that's a uh, very appropriate uh, thing. But, you know, I, I've got to think that uh, uh, the whole thing with the weight on the Traveler was a huge deal because it costs so much in, you know, to lift stuff into space. And it's really been broken down by the weight. So anytime you see it costs X number of dollars to lift this into space, it's based on those uh, weight ratios. Oh, without a doubt. Um, you know, I did a little research just because... I'm curious. I want to go to space one day. And uh, this is one of the things that I put on my bucket list. So there are different ways to get into space. Right now, the one that looks the most viable is with Virgin Galactic. That's a branch of Virgin Atlantic, or Virgin, the uh, big company. For decades, only a few privileged individuals could dare dream of traveling beyond Earth's orbit, and that all set to change when Richard Branson brings space exploration to the mega-rich masses. So, in April, Virgin Galactic hit a milestone. The rocket motor the, the company has been testing on the ground was fit into Spaceship Two, the spacecraft that, for the next few years onwards, will bring uh, space travel to the general public. Now, Space travel doesn't come cheap. One seat on this spaceship, too, cost about $250,000. Now, 
that's still about 1% of the price you needed to pay to go into space as a private citizen. Uh, when Dennis Tito, the first space tourist, we call him, uh, bought a seat on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft in 2001, it cost him about $20 million. Uh, though flights won't commence until next year at the earliest, Virgin Galactic has already sold 640 seats to space enthusiasts all over the world. So what does 250000 get you? It starts with an experience uh, of three days training at the Spaceport America in New Mexico. There's a lot to do with getting you psychologically prepared for a trip that's absolutely about sensory overload, says Attenberg a spokesman for uh, Virgin Galactic. The flight itself accommodates only six passengers, lasts two and a half hours, and culminates with a congratulatory champagne at the spaceport. Space travelers get to leave their seats and experience several minutes of geogra er, uh, zero gravity and perhaps the most iconic view ever afforded to mankind. Yeah, now this is uh, uh, not going to get you to the uh, ISS. This is no. just you know a quick little up and down like pleasure flight. You know, like the six passengers, it's kind of like going up in a uh, little Cessna or something like that for a sightseeing tour. Yeah, it costs a little more. You could buy yeah. a Cessna for the price of this ticket. <laughs> That you can, that definitely, indeed, you can, but it, it, it's it's not going to get you anything uh, close to what you can do if you actually paid that uh, full amount to go to the ISS. It's a quick little uh, tour, but it also doesn't take as long because there's uh, all that training and everything. And if you're just looking to get, you know, a few micros into your uh, pockets when you go up there and say that they've been in space or maybe a uh, uh, travel bug or two, you know, this, this would probably be a cool way to do that. And, you know, of course, you get the experience of you know, getting uh, into space and being weightless for a few minutes. Now, I, I want to say that I heard something about it uh, being only about 10 minutes or 15 minutes of weightlessness. That's probably realistic. I mean, most of the effort is to get you up uh, out of the Earth's atmosphere and then landing. It takes a bit longer. So, yeah, you're... Uh, you know, you're left with maximum half an hour of weightlessness. Yeah, yeah, and it's mostly uh, just gliding down. It's not like it's a powered descent or anything. You know, not that right. you would need it because uh, it's traveling pretty quickly with all that gravity. <laughs> gravity is your enemy when you're trying to get out of the Earth's orbit. Yeah, now we should actually talk a little bit more about uh, what it takes to get to the ISS, but before we do, let's uh, touch on some other ways that you might be able to uh, get into space personally. And uh, you had uh, actually done a little bit um, of research with uh, something that the uh, European Space Agency is looking at doing. I tell you, this is something I really want to do. So, you know, those things that you have passion for, you study about. Uh, the European Space Agency has used a, a special Airbus to run parabolic or zero gravity flights for scientists and astronauts in training. Well, last March, uh, Nova Space, who owns this Airbus, started selling seats to the general public for a relatively reasonable seven thousand nine hundred and thirty-two dollars, so under eight grand. And zero gravity is a bit of a misnomer. This uh, Airbus never leaves Earth's orbit. Rather, the weightless feeling comes from a result of the plane's parabolic flight path. The aircraft shoots up at a 47-degree angle at full engine thrust, at which point everything inside the plane experiences hypergravity and is much heavier. The thrust is then re reduced and the plane is allowed to experience free fall, allowing everything inside to become weightless. Gravity doesn't disappear, but we're in a state of free fall, uh, so with respect to the environment you're in, the airplane, uh, your weight is zero. It, it's really pretty cool. Yeah, so it's basically the uh, vomit comet. That's what they call it. Yeah, so, it, so and for anyone who doesn't know, that's what uh, NASA uses for a lot of the uh, training here on Earth. Is it's, uh, I want to say that was a 727. Do you remember? Uh, I want to say they changed it out to a 757, but I could be wrong. Well, that could be, because as I recall, they were using that same 727 or whatever it was. It might have been a 737, but I thought it was a 727. They were using that for like 20 or 30 years, and they were complaining mm -hmm. that it was costing too much, so they had to get a new one. 
Yeah, and they don't come with just standard engines. They need a little bit more power. I mean, 47 degrees, it's, you know, you consider a 45 degree angle straight up. That's hard for a large airplane to accomplish. Oh, yeah, but you don't have the weight that you'd have on a lot of the uh, commercial flights or uh, uh, cargo true. flights, so that definitely helps as well. Now, the weightlessness or the weightless period is only 20 seconds. So, you know, if you think by the time, okay, we're weightless, you unbuckle your seatbelt, you float to where you want to be, you got, you know, 10 seconds left. Um, so, but they do this about 30 times, so you can get, you know, a feeling for it. Yeah, it gives you a, a feel, but again, you're not actually getting into space. No. So this is just for you to get that feeling of space, and there are some other options for the uh, suborbital flights, as they're called. Uh, in X-Core uh, Aerospace, you uh, uh, found something on these guys? Yeah, they're developing a suborb or suborbital vehicle called the Lynx. Uh, it'll take off uh, on a runway under rocket power, and unlike Spaceship 2, it doesn't require a mothership. It's so designed for rapid turnaround. You'll be able to fly it four times a day. Because of this, you know, it has fewer seats than Spaceship 2, carrying one pilot and one spaceflight participant on each flight. So it's very, you know, personalized. Yeah, that sounds uh, pretty cool. I'd like to uh, check out what that's actually going to be. Uh, and then uh, Armadillo Aerospace uh, has something coming, too. They're working on a two-seat uh, VTOL, or vertical takeoff and landing rocket, called the Hyperion. And uh, hopefully they're going to start launching uh, uh, people <laughs> here in the next year or so. Well, that's, that's always kind of interesting, because uh, as I understand it, those are actually going to be the whole rocket shoots up and then comes right back down. You know, it's just this, like, big stick landing you know, yes. Kind of like in the old sci-fi movies. Yeah, uh, you know, I've seen um, some of the SpaceX stuff, and it looks like uh, Flash Gordon spaceship of the 30s and 40s. Yeah, you and know, we should also up, mention comes back uh, down. Yeah, we should also mention SpaceX is getting into a lot of this type of thing too, because NASA has terminated uh, their space program yeah. essentially. You know, their launch uh, vehicles. There's no shuttles anymore. They're not doing any new rocket ships right now. They do have some stuff on the uh, uh, burners, as I understand it, but they're a long way out, and the way that they're chartered now is actually they have to use private companies to encourage a private space uh, eh, business, shall we say. And you know, there has been uh, vehicle launches to put your satellite into space, but it hasn't been manned, and they've never done the uh, you know, delivery of supplies to things like the ISS, and now that's handled by SpaceX with uh, uh, automated capsules, which is kind of cool. Completely automated, from launch to landing, all done without a person in the craft. It, I think it's really cool. So they can get supply missions up to the ISS uh, without needing to, dare I use the term, risk an astronaut. Yeah, yeah, and well, and it makes it a whole lot cheaper and easier to get stuff up there. You know, astronauts are extra weight; they have to have the uh, oxygen and everything, and water. You know, you have, yeah, and water, and you have to take care of the waste disposal. <laughs> so, yeah, if you can eliminate that uh, astronaut, it makes it a lot easier to get around. Now, we have one last uh, suborbital flight that you wanted to mention uh, or option coming from uh, Worldview Enterprises? Yeah, it plans to offer space in a luxurious eight-seat capsule for only $75,000 per ticket. So now this is going to be more like the Red Bull flight. It's going to be lifted by a high-altitude balloon that's going to go about 20 miles up, stay aloft for two hours, and then return back to Earth. Now, I can't see how you get a balloon to go up that high and come back down. Normally you have to pop the balloon and that's the part I'm not so fond about. Uh, so passengers will have uh, will be among the few who have seen the curvature of the Earth with their own eyes. Yeah, so yeah, I think now that cool. that actually intrigues me more than any of these other options, just because that's getting into uh, that terrain of the low Earth orbit stuff, which we'll mention that uh, in a little while too, because we had a guest on who actually launched a cache into orbit and 
those gash, there's actually two of them that he's done, and both mm-hmm. of those gashes are still available to be found. And he's using the exact same technology. Now, exactly. he's, the balloon and the capsule is a little smaller for just the geocache, but it's the exact same process. I would think it would be a lot smaller, and you don't have to well, worry as yeah. much about the landing. Yeah, yeah, you, you just let the thing fall. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not so fond about going up in a balloon, to be honest with you. I, I'm sure you parachute down, everything's nice and safe, but yeah, I, I want to be in a vehicle that has some control. Well, you, you can get a lot of control with uh, some of those parachutes, so that, that probably is an excellent way to uh, handle it, and it's a lot better than trying to do a probably controlled descent in a balloon, because uh, from that altitude, I'd have to think it's probably pretty tough to control where you're going to land if you're not uh, uh, coming down you know, quickly enough. Right. You know, you've got a lot of uh, uh, tougher maneuvering to do with all of those uh, space winds and stuff. Now, we did mention earlier that none of those are going to get you to the ISS, and there are these space tourists who have gone up there, and uh, it's seven space tours so far, is that correct? That's all I could find, seven people uh, that aren't part of a national space program that have actually paid to go up in a rocket. Right, and these are guys uh, who have lots and lots of money, and the Russians are the only ones who are doing it, and I I totally remember a lot of uh, nastiness going on between NASA and the Russian space program at the time because they don't like the idea of private citizens being, you know, up there in the space station. Exactly. And uh, at least for the first few guys that went up, they were restricted to the Russian section of the ISS. Yeah, I remember that as well. And uh, I don't know if that's still the case. I don't think it is, but even so, I can understand, you know, they want... uh, uh, astronaut who has had proper training in the space station. Yeah, and you don't want to uh, risk someone that you know accidentally depressurizing the space station or something because they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you mean that's not the toilet handle? Yeah. Now uh, we did have a, a question from uh, uh, Brody uh, Topham. Um, uh, is there a fear of getting stuck in orbit? And I presume they're talking about the balloon and. The answer is basically, with any of these, not really because you're still in the uh, gravitational pull of the Earth. So it's not like you're really going to get stuck up there. It's going to come down no matter what. It's just a matter of time. Uh, I think the ISS is actually in an orbit that can maintain itself, though. Do you remember if that's correct? Yeah, that seems right. I know they don't have any thrusters keeping the ISS in place. But wasn't there a song in the 70s that what goes up must come down? Yeah, basically. Yeah, that's, that's the same thing we're dealing with here. In any case, let's get back to uh, the guys who have actually uh, had the cash to pull this off. And uh, uh, it started with uh, Dennis Tito in uh, 2001. He was the mm-hmm. first guy to do it. And he paid the uh, Russian space agency $20 million. $20 million. Holy and cow. These guys have to go through that whole training and everything to get up there. It's not like you can just, you know, hey, I'm going to go, and you have to pass the health exams and everything else. So, you know, you have to be in good shape to do this. It's not it's like... months of training. It's not yeah, exactly. three days at a spaceport. It's months of training. So you, you've got to be, you know, very wealthy to be able to pull this off to the point where you don't have to worry about uh, your work. You don't have to worry about your business. Someone else is taking care of that for you because you're going to be doing very intense training for a while on top of spending that uh, $20 million to get up there. But that was, uh, you know... 2001. Yeah, a dozen years ago, and the price has been going up. Now, the one that we are all uh, interested in is Richard Garriott, because he went up in 2008 and placed that uh, uh, cash on the ISS. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm having problems with that now, too. (laughs) But he paid $30 million for that privilege. Yeah, exactly. So I was it an extra $10 million just to carry the cash into space? Well, it's uh, <laughs> seven years later and $10 million. Uh, cost of inflation, I guess. Uh, and rocket fuel's not cheap. No, no. Well, and it's uh, it definitely isn't. And for anyone who doesn't know what that IIS, I, ISS cash, <laughs> man, I'm starting to sound like you now. I know. Uh, 
but the uh, ISS cache is just basically a locker on the Russian section of the uh, space station. Exactly. You know, it's not like it's anything really that exciting, but uh, it if, because it's in the ISS, it's pretty exciting. Although so, I guess if you had a uh, even a locker cache in like a train station, it would be kind of exciting because there aren't many of those. That's true. You'd have to pay a quarter every time somebody got the key, though. Well, I'm thinking if someone were able to do that, they'd have to uh, uh, figure out a different way. You know, maybe you have to go and find a token or something. You know, it's a multi-stage with a token that you have to drop in. Now, I have found a cache that uh, you. It was a multi-stage. At the first stage, you found a key, which gave you the coordinates for the second stage or the final, which was a lockbox right in downtown. You know, you put the key in, you open it up, you sign the log, you turn the lock back, and you got to go back to the first stage and return the key. But I thought that was a great idea. It's right there, right in downtown, right on the main street, but it's locked, so muggles can't get in there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I like that idea. So, as you know, the problem being, as long as someone doesn't uh, call the cops on it, thinking it's a uh, nefarious device. Uh, it was a standard utility box. Oh, okay. So that's not too bad at all. You know, screwed to the wall of a business, and you know, because it has the key, nobody pays attention to it. Yeah, it absolutely. Looks like everything else. Absolutely. Well, getting back to the uh, guys who had gone to the ISS, there's uh, uh, only been two since then. The last uh, time that they went up was in uh, 2009, so four years ago. And at that point, it was costing $40 million to get up there. So that's not anything that most of us are going to even be able to conceive of. Exactly. And for the time being... There is no way for us to get that ISS cash. Exactly. So all we can do is, uh, you know, stand by and listen for when uh, uh, Rick, Richard, I forgot his name now. I'm scrolling <laughs> back up. Hang on. I have to look at it. Rick uh, Mastri Master, uh, Mastriano. The astronaut Rick. Rick uh, when, when he signs the log, and, and I assume he has to return to Earth to actually uh, log it? I don't know. Is is there internet on the I I ISS? There is internet on the ISS, uh, but as I understand it, it's really, really slow. So I'm pretty huh. sure he'll be using that old WAP site. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I don't think he's going to get phone signal up there. No, no, but I, it, it, it's, I'm sure, not that tough for them to... Uh, uh, yeah. Have someone at Groundspeak log it for him. Yeah, I think that can happen pretty easily. Well, if nothing else, they have to get the uh, travel bug into the uh, cache for the uh, teaching purposes, right? There you go. What I mean, you think about the views that you have there from the International Space Station, and you think there's a travel bug that's going around the Earth. Is it 15 times a day, I believe? That that International Space Station it That sounds a about right. Um, it, it's something in the mid-teens, but yeah. uh, it I can't does, remember if it was uh, 16 or 15. It does have a, a, a set of coordinates on Earth, and that's at the launch pad in um, Russia. Right, That that's for the, the cache cosmodrome. Itself. Right, but that's not where it is, but you have to have coordinates to hide a cache, so that's where right. they, they put it. Yeah, and unfortunately, it would be really confusing if the thing were constantly uh, following the path and they kept updating the cords. Can you imagine getting the ISS cache in your uh, pocket query every so often? <laughs> hey, there it is overhead. I can't yep, see can't it here in the it. northwest. It's too cloudy now. Yeah, well, the ISS travels at, uh, what is it, 77,000 miles an hour or something mm -hmm. relative to Earth? But, you know, when you're looking at it from your backyard and you're looking up on a clear night, it looks like it's moving relatively slowly, but you have to realize how far away that thing is. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the thing is it's going uh, so so uh, uh, quickly at such a uh, uh, huge distance. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. It's 17,100 miles an hour or 4.791 miles per second. I wish I had my commute were that quick. Yeah, that would be really nice. 
but you gotta you gotta find a way to lower gravity in order to do that. That's the hard well, part. Hey, that would make my diet a lot easier. Yeah, you wouldn't need to lose weight. You you are less weight. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, we're getting a little silly now. <laughs> But let's get to caches that have been in space that you can actually find. And we mentioned this a little bit earlier, and we had a whole show where we talked about it, and that was uh, the GeoGearHeads Beta 27 on orbiting cache. And Echo 6 Charlie, which is just the letter E6C, and you can go back and find that in the uh, links here, uh, did launch two caches into space, actually. And what he did was that whole balloon method where he just had the balloon with a whole bunch of extra stuff, uh, including a cache and some travel bugs, uh, that he launched, it came down, and wherever it landed was where that cache was placed. So there's two different versions. The original one is Pineland Sputnik 2010, a geocache odyssey. And then more recently, he did the Leaf MMXII, uh, geocache from space, and he was actually nice enough to send a travel bug up for us, so we have a uh, Cache Maniacs in Space travel bug out there that uh, has been into space. It has, and I showed it off at the block party. I've shown it off at a couple of places around here. I should send that back to you so you can start uh, showing it off. Yeah, I'm thinking at this point uh, we probably should actually uh, let that go and let some other people find it too. Let it go into the wild? You yeah. can let travel bugs into the wild? You can. It's not necessarily safe, but yes, you can. Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe uh, you got to put that on your uh, watch list, guys, and uh, see if you can discover it. In any case, uh, so there are some of those caches out there. I want to say that there are others who have done similar things. I haven't been able to find any of them with the... Uh, um, bulk of finds these days being just the cash in space events that have been running around you know it's tough to find anything aside from the one that we already knew about or actually it's two we already knew about but uh, it, it, it's something that you can do if you go back listen to that uh, orbiting cash show yeah you, know, you could probably actually uh, figure out a way to put this up uh, through that and Give Echo 6 Charlie a call, and I'm sure he'd be happy to help you out with it, too. Maybe we get more caches that have been in space. I love the idea of launching this up, and wherever it lands, that's where the cache is. Now, Echo 6 Charlie, I want to say got lucky, but I, I think there was, a, there was more than just luck involved. He did some planning here. That where these cache, caches landed, one, the second one was on private property, and the uh, the property owner was just excited to say, oh, I had something in space land on my property? Of course you can leave it there. Yeah, and this is not in like highly populated areas. That's right. something else that should be noted. You can't do this around population centers. Yeah, so New York City is not, not going to work. No, well, and even my area here isn't going to work. And, you know, I would think that you're going to have to travel quite a bit as well because you might have a uh, scuba cache if you tried launching it from uh, your neck of the woods. Could be, you know, I might be able to go up to the top of Mount Rainier, which is, you know, fourteen thousand four hundred feet, and launch it from there. It'll, it'll get to orbit just that much quicker. Well, exactly. You'll need a much smaller uh, balloon and less uh, helium, and maybe even uh, carry a bigger cache. There you go. Yeah. And uh, I got a good chance there. It'll get caught in the jet stream, and it'll end up almost where you are. Well, that'd be interesting. Yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, he had mentioned, though, was the satellite or the GPSs were actually cutting out on the uh, uh, units. On the phones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were talking about this uh, uh, in some of the previous shows as well. Even like airplanes, GPS really doesn't work because you're too high and the satellites uh, for the GPS system aren't built for that. So this has been an ongoing issue with uh, people trying to use their GPSs on planes and things like that. You know, if you have the uh, equipment for the planes, they're actually built to work around these uh, limitations, exactly. but your standard units aren't going to handle that altitude. And plus, if you're in the plane, you know, it's a big metal tube with uh, pressurization that affects all kinds of other stuff, you know, especially if you have, like, those barometric uh, altimeters. 
Right. I remember playing with that on the uh, Colorado, and it said we were at like 300 feet when we were cruising at uh, something like 35,000, I think it was. I was going to say, don't tell Delta, but I've turned my GPS on during the flight, you know, and it registers you're going 600 miles an hour. That, uh, yeah. That That's a fun track to save. Yeah. Well, I, my problem was I accidentally didn't turn it off, essentially. <laughs> It, it, it well actually what happens is it actually turned itself on after I had gone through security but yeah it it was on for the flight which I did not want because my batteries were dead by the time I got Oops. to the ground in any case uh, everyone now probably knows that across North America you can uh, get Wi-Fi in the planes and that's usually provided by GoGo which is the name of the company. And we've talked many times about uh, Glimpse on this show and how cool that is. Well, I found it really interesting because about a week or so ago, GoGo and Glimpse announced that they'd teamed up to share your location from inside the plane. So it's not going to be using the location that's coming from your device. It's actually going to be sharing the location from the plane but I thought that that was a really cool idea, especially because there's so many people I know who love to track where their friends are on the uh, route mm -hmm. to wherever, whether it be someone who's actually trying to track you to pick you up at the airport or just someone at home who's looking to track it. Plus, if you're looking to do a blog post or something, you can uh, have it save it to your Evernote, and then you have that nice screenshot that you can drop in your uh, blog post when you're done. There you go. And will it record your speed at that time? Hey, I'm blogging at 600 miles an hour. I'm pretty sure it would. You know, I. it's just my personality. I don't necessarily trust the flight trackers that, you know, the plane is where it says it is. So this, you know, if I'm going to pick up a friend at the airport, and I'm assuming a tech-savvy friend who would want to do something like this, they can tell me, hey, you know, this is exactly where I am, and from there we can get an idea and calculate. Yeah, now I do wonder what's going to actually happen for real with these because the data that you get off of uh, the web, you know, and publicly available data isn't as accurate as uh, you might think it is sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that is because they just want to make sure that uh, they're not slamming systems and, you know, the People who need it have priority, but it's also largely now because they're afraid of someone knowing where a plane is, yeah. which is a little bit silly because yeah, it, really what it is is they're afraid someone on the plane would know where it is and be able to blow the plane up if they had a remote trigger, which, you know, I guess that's uh, possible. I'm not going to get into that, but... Uh, no, don't. We'll get shut down by the NSA. It, well, we're probably already on their watch list. <laughs> but in any case, uh, you know, it, it's one of those uh, uh, situations that don't expect the flight data to probably be all that accurate with this. We don't know a whole lot about what's going on, but I'm assuming they're going to be getting the uh, delayed data. And if nothing else, if you're traveling at 600 miles an hour, you have to think that where you are now, by the time it gets back to the ground and posted to the Internet, is where you were at least you know, a second or two ago, which at 600 miles an hour is, you know, a mile or two off. Exactly. And I wonder if that location can be fed back to a, a smartphone or a tablet and allow the mapping program there to figure out, you know, here's the, here's the uh, airport I'm going to. How long is it going to take me to get there? Yeah, that's a good question. But I th uh, the GoGo -Go wireless itself has uh, some of that kind of information that it can put up as uh, bars on your web page. So you don't even have to have a special app. It just shows it to you in flight, which is pretty cool. But at the same time, uh, from what I, you know, I haven't actually experienced that because the last time I flew, GoGo -Go didn't provide those kind of services. Mm -hmm. But they did have a nice little uh, pop-up that I had up on my laptop over at the side that showed where I was and how far I was going. But uh, uh, from the people I've heard who have flown with the GoGo -Go Wireless and those banners across all their pages say it's really obnoxious because it gets in the way. And imagine. if you have something like uh, a secure connection, it has to break that secure connection in order to put that up for you. Right. Well, and uh, I've been on a few flights where they've offered it for free. I'm personally just way too cheap to pay for Wi-Fi uh, on a plane, you know. Every, anybody who knows me should know I'm flying 
I'm not going to answer your question. Too bad for you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I am the bad cop after all. Uh, but when it's free, it's really nice. I mean, uh, I was able to text with my wife using uh, Google Voice and tell her, you know, hey, I'm at 30,000 feet. She goes, how are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Well, as a side note, they've also announced that uh, they have an app coming out for uh, smartphones mm -hmm. that will allow you to text using your number from 30,000 feet as well. So you don't even have to use something like Google Voice. You just need their app, and it registers your phone number and allows you to send and receive texts. I don't know if I like that, to be honest with you. <laughs> Yeah, well, if you're into it, I guess it's good, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, they're talking about being able to make phone calls, and that's what scares me. And, you know, I, I totally understand the whole thing about, uh, uh, you know, it's private time on the plane, you want to sleep, you don't want people talking, but I'm more concerned. I don't want to be the person on the other end getting a call on the plane where they can't hear me because the plane is so loud, and all I hear is the jet engines with them mm -hmm. shouting at me. Yeah. And the fact, you know, you've got 150 people packed into a tin tube and each one is yelling to talk on the phone. Exactly. So, yeah, I'm and not so sure crying. I like that idea. But, hey, at least uh, you have that option. You have that option. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I will turn my phone on, give a call as soon as we landed and, you know, they say you can do that uh, and tell them, hey, landed, you know, I'll give you more information once I get in the terminal. Yeah, well, and we're recording this on the day that uh, another airline is making headlines because the pilot uh, uh, made a statement about uh, making an emergency landing that didn't come out quite right. Uh, everyone on the plane thought he said they were going down, in, which he did. He said they were going down to X number of feet. Uh, and, well, everyone started trying to call their loved ones and, uh, you know, hey, I'm going to die, you know, I love you, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, that's another hazard yeah. that we don't want to happen necessarily. No. And the FAA said that they're, uh, they're allowing more electronic devices to be on uh, during more phases of the flight, let's put it that way. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, that uh, on show 100. That's one of those things that we've got going. And it's not just the FAA as of uh, today. Uh, the uh, European agency has also said that they're going to allow electronics during all stages of flight. So something to uh, stay tuned for for episode 100. That's going to be a special recording next week, right after we record the 3D caches episode. So make sure to uh, tune in for both of those, and uh, certainly they'll be in your feed. But episode 100 is going to be two weeks away, and episode 99 is just one week away. Call in all of your uh, questions, uh, send us your emails, and don't forget that Show 100 next week, we're going to be giving away those uh, gifts to the people who have been uh, nice enough to spread the word about uh, uh, Geo Gearheads. So you can still get in on that action. Just uh, make sure to drop us a note about how you're spreading the word of the Geo Gearheads. The easiest way to do that is to check the Cashomaniacs website at cashomaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes from this and all our episodes. We love hearing from you, our listeners. So leave us feedback by calling 206-350-3647, by emailing geogearheads at cashomaniacs.com, or through the many channels of social media. Your support helps keep the Cashomaniac shows coming, so please consider making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashomaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Umfenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. The show's copyright 2013 by Daryl Wattenberg. All rights reserved. <laughs>